Yeah, that's my next call. So let's see if I click this button. Oh, there we go. All right, cool. We're recording, yeah. and we have you on screen, and it seems to be holding. I know sometimes when I talk on uh, Zoom, it'll start switching around the views. I think I have it logged on you. So when you see this back, Chris, you will see yourself on screen asking questions. Okay. I think Excellent. we're I think we're good to go. So uh, my name is Chris McMillan, and I'm an autonomy student with Season 1. I'm here with Richard Grove of TragedyandHope.com. Richard Grove, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Chris, I think it was very bold and courageous of you to invite me to do an interview. No problem. So my first question is, uh, and most people who are listening to this already have a good idea of who you are, what you're about, what Tragedy and Hope is about. So let's go back to college, university. Mm -hmm. My question for you is in the um, third conditional. Had you never gone to university knowing what you know now, how would, you li how would your life be different, if at all? It's hard because I had to learn what I know now partially by uh, going through university and learning the hard way. So if I was able to transmit what I know now back to a younger person in a similar situation, because I don't have a time machine yet, um, what I would do is articulate that before you go indenturing yourself into uh, a multi, multi year, because the payoff college loans is usually multi decades. It's a preparation of forgetting a mortgage, right? So before you go doing that, you should invest a little money in finding out what you want to do, what's out there in the world, and you might gain some skills and then go travel and apply those skills and learn how to pay your way as you're traveling around the world. So it wouldn't take like a big savings or winning the lottery to live that lifestyle. You have the opportunity and it's better instead. Of, it used to be when I went to school, it was four years. And then sometimes if you changed majors, it takes five years. But now it takes like six years to get out of university. And it's still the same piece of paper that gets you much less than it did when I went to school. So even though I look back and I thought, did school, did university really help me excel? Should I have just kept running my own business like I learned to do during school and just like dropped out of school and focused on that? No, because I think having a degree at some point probably gave me the, the internal confidence, but there was an opportunity for that confidence, right? So even though you get a degree and you think you could go work in the corporate world, my, my degree was in business management, which was kind of a joke because I had learned to run a business as a way to pay for that education. So by the time I got the degree, I'd already run a successful business for several years. Going forward, that college degree that I was going to depend on soon sorted out. I saw all my friends trying to get jobs with theirs and doing the job fairs and waiting in lines and submitting resumes. And then I had to call back on the skills that I had learned outside of school to actually bridge the gap and get my foot in the job world. And um, that was much more successful and lucrative than the path that all my friends were taking, or most of my friends were taking at least. Have you ever actually used your college degree? No. I do have it hanging in my office upstairs behind behind like a computer uh, rack that has all my stuff on it. So it's like it's hung on the wall in a very obscure place that gets no attention at all because it is framed. And, um, you know, it is a, a, a reminder of its lack of importance. Like I never had to use my degree, my transcript, any of that stuff um, to get a job. That was all formality as you as you go through the interview process and if i didn't have it uh it wouldn't have prevented me from getting the job it was just like hr wants you know whatever data that they want the job was gotten in all the cases through networking personal referral interviewing and having high value skills through that process to navigate that process to get into the chair for the opportunity and to be able to knock it out of the park. And then once getting that offer to transact and deliver, that's the other aspect. And then once you do that, you're likely to get recruited out of there to go someplace else to be even more successful, repeat the same process, get, gather, uh, gain more proficiency in those skills, and a year and a half later, do it again. So I probably did that every year and a half for <laughs> my whole career. Excellent. Um yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Although my first job was only eight months. I started there uh, before I graduated. 
So I didn't go to graduation like all the rest of the kids I went to school with. I already had a job. I was working and getting paid. So I got a paycheck by the time they got their certificate of graduation. Um, and I stayed there for eight months because someone inside of that company that was an executive was talking to an executive of another company. And uh, I got an offer from the other company to come do an interview. So it was somebody in our pro, like the programming department, one of the computer guys. Excellent. It all starts with relationships, doesn't it? Building up from there. Yeah. Yeah. How to introduce yourself, how to, you know, carry your own weight, how to help other people that you see need help to, to be a team player. And then if you meet and exceed your goals <clears throat> on a regular basis, then that gets you good attention. And within an organization, the reason that I moved every couple of years was you can only go up so far so fast in an organization before there's like a, a glass ceiling of some sort. So yeah. if, you, if you're in one job and you gain a lot of good skills, you can almost sometimes double your pay by just going to a different company uh, or a slightly different product line that's near enough that you would be able to transition your skills. A lot of times you also have non-compete agreements, so you can't go to a direct competitor if you have one of those agreements in place. Fast forward to uh, Tragedy and Hope. What would you say since you started the website has been, um, if you can single it out to one challenge or a couple, uh, what would you say have been your biggest challenge since you started tragedyandhope.com? Well, I guess most people would assume, given its topic, that the challenge would be to find credible evidence that relates to that topic. Because they're like, you know, people might say, oh, you named your site after one history book? Like, how much relevant information? can be tied to that one history book and it's a lot it's substantial so i've never had a shortage of information to work with or to produce upon to to demonstrate and share it with people i mean i have <laughs> i have 10 times the the amount of content that needs to be processed than i have already processed so i have uh foreign relations council on foreign relations magazine going back for like you know there's decades and decades of them in the next room in the library. There's the the four volume set, the original papers of the Round Table. So the, the Round Table is a British group that got America into World War One, and you know here's here's aspects of their planning and communication through that, right? So there's a cornucopia of content that has yet to be produced, and I hope someday to have the uh, the administration ability to be able to marshal those resources and get it out to the public faster. So that's never been the struggle. The struggle has been, uh, you know, just doing the day to day without because this is a this is a sector, you know, anything supporting freedom and cognitive liberty is a sector of our economy that is underfunded, underappreciated and sorely necessary because without freedom, there is no entrepreneurism. There, there's no swapping houses and flipping houses and, you know, all the other things that people are doing out there to like make make money or do as their side hustle. All that stuff goes away under totalitarian uh, systems of despotism, communism, uh, socialism, anywhere where you're not allowed to have private property is a place where you become property. People need property in order to sustain themselves and live unless you're part of an artificial group that's maintained like a, a herd of cattle, right? So there are certain aspects we need to, to have freedom in our lives physically and mentally and there's not a lot of funding in that area. It's not a very popular area. So you see a lot of people do good work for years and years and years. And they always have to kind of have their hand out, you know, trying to get donations, trying to do fundraisers. And they don't have a lot to, to offer in exchange. And I don't see that as being, to use a term from the other side, I don't see it being sustainable into the future. I think they're going to make... The internet, a barrier to entry, they're going to attach more costs to it. They're going to have more regulations. They're just going to be able to you know, use bureaucracy to weed out less than desired competitors. And then they just waive those rules of bureaucracy for people on their side. Right. So if you were if you were espousing collectivism and despotism and globalism, then you would have like a you'd have a grant from George Soros and have part of that eighteen billion dollars that he set aside for kind of uh, anti liberty or, or or activities corrosive to liberty. How about that? Yeah, yeah. So 
do you think the the freedom minded mentality is it catching on is it growing are we at a stagnate um what do you think i think it doesn't matter i mean i think it's growing but in the real case it doesn't matter because i still need to do what i need to do regardless right um so it's like can i open can i empty the ocean one teaspoon at a time probably not probably gonna take a lot more teaspoons but uh somebody needs to be doing that anyway it just needs to be done i have the aptitude and inclination to do it thus far i've had a lot of supportive uh listeners and audience members and subscribers who have helped me achieve the goals that i've needed to uh, achieve so far i have much bigger goals now but those goals are self-supporting and won't necessarily need so much i'm actually going to have need a lot less support from the handout can i get a donation and i'll be able to exchange value to va for value more fluidly than i have in the past um because I've had to put a lot of conscious effort into developing those means to be self-reliant. And then also in doing that for myself, it becomes a solution for other people who are peers or colleagues of mine who have the same sort of challenges, right? There's any number of people like John Taylor Gatto did a lot of great work. A lot of people appreciate him, but he pretty much died penniless and his wife's in the same situation. And that there's numerous people who came before him. I mean, Stan Monteith, who pirated tragedy and hope the book back in the 70s i don't think he died a rich man um g edward griffin's been doing what he's been doing for 60 years i think he still struggles to raise money for the projects and the things that he wants to see done and i don't think that's necessarily i think it's how it is right now but i think it can be easily changed and rectified so that we can all be more self-reliant in our ability to be economically self-sufficient to be able to exchange enough value often enough to stay ahead of the curve of the expense coming at us as producers or people who publish. If not, then freedom gets caught in that tidal wave of free market could, didn't support itself, right? But it's not really a free market. And a lot of people who would like to support freedom and liberty, they get all the excess currency that they have sucked off in the process, either through taxation or through you know, spending it on liabilities because they don't know enough yet to invest it in assets, including themselves, including their skills, because the skills are like how you achieve mobility and how fast you can get from A to B. Right. So I don't know. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. That was definitely one of the lessons that have um, changed my point of view is discovering the difference between asset and liability. It was something that was never fully conscious on the forefront of my way of thinking until the autonomy course. Absolutely. Well, and uh, pr prior to that, the only reason I know about it is because Robert Kiyosaki took the time to tell the story of rich dad, poor dad. And along that story, he drops all these nuggets that I think are essential that ev like I often, <laughs> I have often said that if people only had one book, if I had to tell you to read one book, that's going to change your life. You read rich dad, poor dad, you get the idea of, how cash flow works, how you can use it to invest in assets and stop spending on liabilities, and the difference between rich people and poor people thinking, right? It's their thinking and their actions that tie together. It's not just like in that movie, The Secret, where you can just make a vision board and hope you're going to be wealthy. No, you got to attach that those thoughts to actions. And that's what Kiyosaki was originally teaching. And he's probably got, there's probably 10 or 15 books associated with that series. So um, I dug real deep into it over the years but i wish i would have known about that book back in like 2002 2003 2004 any of that time 2001 any of that time frame would have been a good time for a young rich to have read rich dad poor dad yeah a young chris as well <laughs> yeah thought emotion reaction grammar yeah grammar logic rhetoric. rhetoric yep um speaking of rich dad poor dad i just a few days ago gave that book to my 14 year old nephew He's quite mainstream, goes to schools. Parents would have no, you know, they would have no idea of these topics covered in Tragedy and Hope. So will he take the bait? Let's hope so. Well, that's, um, that's, a, tough, that's a tough mountain to climb. But uh, the, the, the path over that mountain that's easiest, I think, would be the Rich Dad, Poor Dad audiobook. Because, for instance, when I recommended it to my brother, my brother's not a big reader either. He did, but he'll listen to an audiobook because he drives all the time. 
and he had to take my nephew to a hockey tournament up in New Hampshire. So they're driving from Pennsylvania to New Hampshire and they listen to Rich Dad, Poor Dad the way up and the way back. And then my brother said, what other books does he have that I should... <laughs> He said, and that my nephew really liked it too. So it was like a bonding experience. And that's the type of bonding experience and learning experience that you have for the rest of your life. You're going to need, as long as there's money, you're going to need to know the difference between assets and liabilities. And as long as you have time to spend and somebody else isn't telling you how to spend it, you're going to have to decide whether or not to invest your time or to spend it on liabilities, right? So there's some essential concepts that he brought forward and, um, I've never met him before, so I'm excited to meet him at the Red Pill Conference here in Hartford. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. Next question, mm -hmm. um, who has been or who have been the biggest influences in the life of Richard Grove? Um, my mom and dad, my brother, both sets of my grandparents, my wife, my son people I participate with in this course. Um, not really people I went to high school with, not really people I went to college with, not really nope. people that I in, involuntary, uh, involuntarily like worked with at a corporation. Those weren't like long-term, but people who have really taken time to understand where I'm coming from and to listen and give me feedback and have always let me make my own decisions but have always also been there to help me for, you know, they're like, Oh, well you didn't listen, but I knew you weren't listening. So here I, you know, help you out. And it's been a, a rewarding learning experience so far. And I know that, uh, I'm always appreciative of it because I know not everyone has that type of situation for those of us who do have that type of situation. I think it comes with a certain responsibility to be able to like leverage it and do the most I can to not only, take care of myself, take care of my family, but to be able to do that so well that I also have time to help other people solve their problems. And I think there's a confection current of uh, causality there that the more you put in for in the right way to help the right people with the right things, the more that that, that can come back and help you and then pay it forward, you know? Yeah, all about adding value, isn't it? Well, and before you can add value, you need to talk to people <laughs> you need to be able to have a conversation be a good listener and as people talk to you inevitably they're encountering challenges and obstacles and problems and a lot of times they talk to people who can't help them who aren't even listening and if they were listening they still don't have the skills or insights or even just the basic questions you would ask in that situation to figure it out right so by being able to have these skills within oneself you're building a culture of excellence from yourself outward. So as you learn them for yourself, then you're also able to demonstrate these things for others. You're also able to help ask the questions that lead other people to getting the answers they seek. Instead of being a know-it-all and saying, well, you're doing it all wrong, here's how to do this. Is that not working out? What, is, what about that doesn't look right to you? Well, this thing doesn't go here. Well, well what? You know, and you help them think through it. You ask them some questions, right? Uh, how, why, what? These are good questions. And then you're able to have a conversation, discover some issues that are going on, have them go through some thinking they probably didn't do for themselves, and then uh, come to conclusions and move forward. And throw in a bit of uh, NVC as well. That always helps. Well, nonviolent communication. I would say it's like a specific tool for specific circumstances in some cases in its specific, most specific form where you would call upon that process. Yeah. You probably have a situation you need to handle. So you want to call upon, but otherwise there's a lot of similarities between NVC and just having where I come from, like a, a polite, casual conversation, right? It's not all about me, me, me. It's me having a conversation with you and you ask me some stuff and I ask you some stuff. And we're trying to figure out stuff. It's more interactive, right? So I think a lot of that's what's missing from today's society is the, the connection, the interaction, the ability to listen, and then coupling that with thinking that's attached to understanding some high value skill sets because it's those skill sets. The reason they're high value is because they affect people in ways such that, you know, 
the money is less valuable than solving the problem. That's how business is done, right? So the service has to be more valuable than the price being paid. So for some people who are um, looking to get into a business or something and they put in, they're, they're going to put up a quarter million dollars and put their mortgage on the line with the bank. Maybe you should invest some money and ask some questions to make sure that all that money doesn't get wasted or spent on the wrong thing or miss, you know, all the different things that happen with new businesses. Um, you can kind of sort that out. And another aspect of, through communication is just learning how to work with some people um, and help each other come, overcome the challenges. So uh, somebody might say, hey, I'm trying to do this with my business and make these phone calls. And then somebody could say, hey, I, let me help you out. I'll play the, uh, the prospect for you. And you, I'll, you know, go through the, the emotions and we'll discover the objections and we'll work on your rough spots, clear, clarify your message and intent, right? Go through a whole bunch of things that would take you a long time linearly to do yourself it can be done very quickly when you have a multitude of people trying to help save that, you know, solve that problem. So it's kind of a, not a formal mastermind per se, but anytime you have a bunch of smart people get together trying to solve a problem. That's a lowercase m mastermind group. So not necessarily like the Napoleon Hill or who was it? Uh, Dale Carnegie. I think it was Napoleon Hill who came up with the mastermind group idea. Think and grow rich, possibly. Or is that Dale Carnegie? I always get them mixed up. You guys have to correct me. I believe you got them mixed up the other day as well, if I recall correctly. Unfortunately, I'm not sure which one is which. It means I should reread their books. It's the, you know, when I learned about these guys originally, this was back in the mid 90s. We had these things called cassette tapes still, <laughs> not even CDs, because these, you know, you'd bootleg somebody else's uh, sales tapes or motivational tapes. You'd just be playing them in the car. So yeah. I came into all this information like one summer during college, and it's like uh, Zig Ziglar, Dale Carnegie, uh, Napoleon Hill, and whoever else. So back then, there was no internet. You're not searching to see what time these guys lived and where they lived and what they looked like. So to me, I do mix up a lot of the concepts. They're all very similar concepts about unblocking the, the blockades within our minds so we can be successful through our actions. Um, my next question kind of ties in with the previous one. <laughs> Hypothetical, you could sit down and have a nice long dinner with anyone, dead or alive, one person, who would it be? I mean, you were only halfway through the question, but I thought I could really use uh, a nice night out with my wife. We've had a we've had a gift certificate or two to a really nice restaurant for longer, long enough that I'm embarrassed to say. So I think we need to find a sitter for Lucas, and that uh, I would like to take her out. We just had an anniversary last week. I would like yeah. to. Uh, maybe I should get that done tomorrow. Let's see. We'll see what her schedule is like. That's great. I was expecting an answer like, oh, Isaac Newton or, you know, somebody like that. But that's a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So you're walking down the street and you overhear some people talking. I'll about tell you what, maybe you'd have a more interesting answer after I got the dinner with the wife out of the way. And then my brain yeah. would be like, <laughs> oh, yeah, Abe Lincoln would be cool or, you know, but right now <laughs> it's it's been a hectic uh, social and business schedule for the past couple months. <laughs> I know you've been putting a lot of time into this course and we, yeah, we appreciate it. Um, my next question, you're walking down the street, you overhear somebody talking about these, oh, these alternative conspiracy theory websites. You've got Infowars, you've got Tragedy and Hope. So they just bundled Tragedy and Hope mm. into the same category as Infowars. So you step in, how would you correct them? Mm. Sometimes I don't correct people when they're in the middle of making mistakes. So if somebody wanted to connect tragedy and hope with Infowars, <clears throat> go ahead and do that. But if you want to go ahead and make another assumption based upon that, I'm going to come out and pull the first floor out from your second floor real quick. Right? So making the, f the first false assumption, mm, no big deal. But when you want to go build something on that and try to do something with it, that's where I would be more likely to defend myself in that situation I, I would you know i'd be patient i you know in that situation i i've read a strategy or tactic or two but i don't like to think like that during my daily my daily every day you know what i'm saying because i think it's 
I would rather focus on my goals and stay on, on track for my goals than to go and play games with other people who don't. It's like uh, the Mark Twain quote. Uh, if you argue with idiots, they'll pull you down to their level and beat you at their own game. Pull you down yep. into the mud at their level, right? And then beat you with their own game. So uh, I find it successful so far that when that kind of drama is going on or people are making ill claims to just stay focused on what I'm doing and delivering value to the people who appreciate it and not try to go out and prove other people wrong, but like don't disprove debunk or defame. I don't see those things as being, I don't see those actions as contributing to freedom, but a lot of people use those actions to take away people's freedom. And sometimes when it's done to innocent people, there's a, yeah, you could go out and make a claim and, yeah, you know, like a claim has been made against you, so you can go out and make a counter statement. But now you're like, they got you into it, right? Now they're taking up your time, your attention, your stress, all this other stuff. And it's like, is that on your plan? Because that's how people get distracted. They go over here and, do, and get. And if I go over here and do this, what happens then? What do I gain? Oh, I, I kept some people who probably aren't strong critical thinkers anyway. From and now, you know, let them let them believe the untrue stuff come back to when you look for evidence then we can have a discussion but you want you know claims allegations um uh claims of allegiances or ties you know um we don't have any direct contact with infowars and uh not seeking this, to in the future uh, <laughs> this was a lesson that a lot of us some people still haven't learned but i have definitely learned when uh, back in the early days of facebook you know getting into political debates wasting your time time you'll never get back so yeah yeah well that said. goes back to guy Ritchie's quote that sometimes you have to prostitute yourself before you find out your true value so you might go out there and prostitute yourself in the way of <clears throat> having political arguments and debates that are never going to go anywhere they're not going to add to your value add to their value you're not going to convince them they're not going to convince you neither one of you is going to learn and you're going to leave out all these things you have in common in order to focus on this one difference that you guys have, which just seems like you guys would be better off spending that much time together being friends than being enemies. Like it comes back to people not prioritizing what they do with their time or still having to be a prostitute and not know what they're doing with their time until they get to the point where like, oh, I value my time enough. I'm not going to engage in those activities and I have priorities that I'm trying to work on. So I'm going to focus on those. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Richard. Um, just one last question. Super easy. I was, um, I, I very, I, I liked a lot the photo that you put up of you and Lisa by the Christmas tree. Um, so I just got to ask, how tall are you? How tall is Lisa? Oh, did I look really tall? I'm six <laughs> two and she's five two. So I'm a foot taller than her. But in that picture, I might be standing closer to the camera or something. So it might look bigger than a foot. I, and, I think uh, it's six two and five two. Too, it doesn't matter what the angle. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time <clears throat> uh, there was a photo taken in my grandmother's basement. My grandfather had these um, these huge train sets because he had had a hard, he was like he was like a truck driver and his dad worked Pennsylvania Railroad. So when he had a heart attack, he was limited to he had to do some work around the house, like something non stressful, non physical activity. So he put up all these train tables downstairs, all throughout the basement. And he built all these amazing like towns and cities and like mountains and connect. It's it was, I've seen some things that are very professional. I was like, oh, my grandfather had you beat on this and this and this. So anyway, when Lisa was uh, visiting there, this was years ago, uh, there was a picture of us taken downstairs. And then I saw the picture afterwards and I was like, oh my God, I'm so much taller than you. <laughs> like I, I don't really see people's height unless they're taller than me, then I'll notice. So if Bad and Eric's brothers were standing around and one's, I think, six, seven, I'd be like, man, who's like, that guy's tall, right? But otherwise, if you're my height or, or shorter, I don't really see, like, so you could be 5'8", and then I wouldn't notice that you're 5'8", until you're some, you'd say something like, I'll be like, oh, you're shorter than me. I, okay, I see, you know, or something like that. But I do notice when there's taller guys, right? So like when I was in my lawsuit for EMC, Skadden Arps brought in, they're two attorneys. Uh, dude was like six six, and the other guy was si like six eight. And I, I said, to, and the one guy was like in a knee brace and crutches. 
because I was like, oh, what's up? What's you know, what's up, tall dude? Tall dude, you having a problem with your? I'll hold the door for you. Here you go. Like, uh, but I definitely knew that they ch they chose those lawyers to intimidate me. It didn't wow. work, but I thought I was like, oh, that's interesting because they did two things: really tall lawyers and a whole lot of dollies of boxes, right? Like when they just bring in box after box, like three boxes at a time, stack, stack, stack. And you're like, that's the evidence they're going to use against me in court. And then you're like, no, it's not. They don't have any evidence. I have evidence. That's a bluff. Right. And then they, they asked me to settle. And in hindsight, maybe I should have settled, but I learned a lot from not settling too. It was just an expensive lesson. <laughs> it's one of the courses I paid for. Very expensive lesson. Well, uh, that's all I've got for now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Those are excellent questions, Chris. All right. So now that the interview's over, how do you feel? How do you feel about that? I mean, have you ever done an interview like that before with an influencer and video capture it? And like, how's it feel? Oh, no, I haven't. No. Um, I feel on certain questions, I, I could have, you know, provided a bit more feedback, but, uh, you know, follow up comments, but I couldn't at the in the moment i couldn't think of anything to say so <laughs> <laughs> that's fine too some of it's just a little experience and other parts of it don't even communicate across like you could you could say some things and people will tell you in the comments that they had no idea for them they just watched oh here, that was a pretty interesting conversation and chris is chris has got a good background he's got lots of books looks like an interesting guy he's asking thoughtful questions i wonder Excellent. i wonder if you'd be doing that if it weren't for integration exercise number four right no if i not. if i had assigned a different type of homework assignment this interview might not be happening <laughs> i'm sure yeah i'm sure no it's 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 applied to uh and it applies to everything personal life to you know to um professional life across the board everything it all kicks in at the same time sales presentations interviewing communication skills um i've always known it was important of course it's important but i never realized just how important it and really the cool is. thing is you never leave your tools at home they're always with you yeah right <laughs> i mean i have certain tools i carry with me every day but they're not the high value tools they're like you know sometimes they get you into high value situations but they're not the high value tools the high value tools you learn to do with your brain and you use the, uh, learn to communicate through your actions absolutely yeah cool i uh, yeah thanks it's a lot, Richard. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, I will. Uh, I'll get more. Give me more. <laughs> All right. So I think you should start interviewing uh, your classmates because it'll give them the confidence to do likewise. And just once everyone gets comfortable talking on video, then that's like a whole new world out there for people. I mean, people talk on Skype to other people they know, but when you can start talking on video to people you don't know and like making progress, excellent. Take, take off. Yeah. I I've got some tech skills I need to refine. And once I get that behind me, um, yeah, the sky's the limit. Man. Yeah. And I'm going to make a, I'll cut a tutorial on how to use, uh, how I use XSplit in my situation. It may be that you find it much easier if you have more than one monitor. Cause I just take that for granted because down here there's four monitors. So I'm like just yep. using it. But for people that had the, the infinite loop, cause it's taking your desktop and then trying to show it's capturing your desktop. That'll happen to be momentarily on this. And then I'll just click a button where it calls up something else. Right. And then I drag something else on screen and it all works out. So I'll try it on a laptop and see well, as Ernie Hancock said, there's that just word. Yeah. The, just, just the button. Just. <laughs> yeah. I have a little spinner here to make decisions like that. Let's see what it says. If this is going to be likely or not, I'll give it some artificial resistance and it says, uh, Reorganize. We should reorganize on this topic. That's the official Excellent. decision by the decision maker. <laughs> it doesn't even take batteries. Excellent. But if you were to ride on the outside of this, it would produce G forces. Pretty sure about that. If you're real <laughs> tiny. We'll save that for another time. All right. So Chris, excellent job. I'm going to uh, cut this and then I'll upload it and then you'll be able to see the, the final product. But I give you uh, I give you an A on this project that wasn't nope. even assigned that you assigned to yourself and asked me to participate in. That's the best kind of assignment, right? Because it's unassigned. That was an integration exercise taken into real life. Nobody even said to do it. Chris is just doing it on his own and you can do the same thing for yourself. 
All right, so All we'll right. close this down. I'll meet you back on Discord. Okay, thanks a lot, Richard. Hey. See you in a second. All right, thank you, Chris.